Good morning, everybody. What a great kickoff we've had to the Good Food Conference 2023. My name's Adam Lehman, and I'm a fermentation scientist at GFI. Thanks for joining us at our session on precision fermentation, and thanks for our moderator and our panelists today. Precision fermentation can provide us with the ingredients that we need to elevate the taste, texture, nutritional value, and appeal of alt protein products. Precision fermentation ingredient containing products are relatively new to market, but the field is built on biotech and biomanufacturing that is both mature and rapidly growing. Here today we'll have perspectives from different stages and the development process for precision fermentation. First, each of our panelists will give a lightning talk to help make all of us familiar with their work and their place in the ecosystem. Next, we'll have a moderated discussion, and after that, it'll be followed by some questions from our attendees. We'll pull some questions from our Swap Card app, so please use the app to submit the questions within the session. And don't forget to connect and reach out to folks in the app as well. So with that, I'd like to welcome our session moderator, Dr. Ship, Dr. Celine Shifteb of Mista Foods. Celine is the head of biotechnology at Mista. She's been working for over 20 years at the interface between science and business, making her our perfect moderator today. So with that, I will turn it over to Celine, and I'll let her introduce herself and our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for the great introduction. And I'm very honored to be uh, hosting this great panel today. Uh, so yes, so uh, I'm Celine. I'm head of biotech here at MISTA. Uh, I'll be really quick about what MISTA is, but uh, MISTA is a hyper-connected ecosystem which goal is to accelerate the pace of innovation for, in the food system to meet the need of the future. It's a membership-based organization, and we have great companies ranging from very large ingredient suppliers like Givaudan to uh, CPG companies like Danone and Conagra and CJ, as well as 25 startups that are really disturb disturbing everything uh, on the passage. One of them is on stage. They can disclose themselves if they want to. Um, so I'll be quick, but uh, Mista is really here to foster innovation, exchange. We have think tank, an accelerator, an incubator. We also have physical location here in San Francisco with kitchens, lab, an extruder, some fermentation capacity, and so on. And uh, our mission is really to deliver transformation experiences. So my wish today for this panel is to give the audience a little bit of an insight into what it really takes to go from the concept of an ingredient to a finished integrated food solution that people actually want to buy and eat. So uh, I'll spare you the terrible uh, discomfort of listening to a French person read very long bios of very accomplished people. So I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. And um, we'll start with uh, Dr. Aleta Schnitzel. Uh, she's the Chief Scientific Officer at Turtle Tree. Aleta. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks to GFI. Um, we're really excited about this panel today. Um, hoping that we get a lot of audience participation and we're going to fly through these intro talks um, so we can get to the discussion. Um, first, I have to figure out how to use the slides. There we go. Um, so as Celine said, uh, my name is Aletta Schnitzler. I'm chief scientist with Turtle Tree. Um, I've been with the company for about a year and a half, almost two years now. And prior to that, uh, my career was built on um, developing bioprocessing technologies. So I spent a lot of time in the um, life science and biotherapeutic realm before transitioning over to alternative proteins. There we go. Uh, so Turtle Tree is a Series A startup company um, incorporated out of Singapore, but we do have um, R&D and operations here on the West Coast as well as the East Coast, and we're focused on developing dairy alternatives. Uh, the original premise of our company was actually to make cell-based milk, but as our co-founders really investigated the technologies as well as the market needs of the dairy industry, we took a shorter-term pivot toward precision fermentation. We're a team of about 42 members, um, and half of those are in scientific roles. Um, more of our folks have scientific backgrounds, but we also have um, teams that we're building out in other functions like commercial operations, supply chain, as we anticipate scaling up the company into next year. 
And we've been talking a lot about the scientists at um, the GFC, but I also want to give a shout out to the engineers, because none of this is going to be possible without really clever engineering. And Turtle Tree right now does have a research project that uh, we are engaging with a design and engineering firm on, and they just bring such creativity and a different perspective to how we're applying our science. So a big shout out to all you guys um, and gals, engineers out there. There's a lot that we're trying to accomplish in this industry, but these are, um, for Turtle Tree, some of our North Star um, objectives. One, of course, is animal free. So we want to get away from um, involving the animal in the process at all, except maybe for identifying the relevant gene that we're then going to put into microbes in order to ferment our specific target. And this is all because we see that protein um, demand is going up and up. But it's not just about delivering a bulk protein, it's also about delivering um, a diversity of proteins and functional proteins as well. We also want these products to be accessible, not only in terms of cost, but also geography. And getting back to the animals a bit, um, there are an estimated 270 million dairy cows on the planet. And that just represents about a quarter of the total cattle on the planet in the world. It's just staggering, it's mind blowing. Most of those cattle are based in the US, Brazil, and India, um, and those herds don't seem that they're going to be reduced at all in the future, unfortunately. Um, in Europe, there may be some herd reduction that we see in the shorter term due to um, emission standards that um, those geographies are trying to meet. But other areas like China are really building up their cattle herds as well, especially in dairy. And these aren't mom and pop dairy um, farms. These are really highly industrialized super farms. So we need to start developing these alternatives and give, present other options um, to consumers. So the protein that Turtle Tree is um, interested in right now is lactoferrin. And for those of you who haven't heard about this wonderful protein that is just highly evolved and multifunctional, um, it's a pretty complex one. It's about 80 kilodaltons. It has 17 disulfide bonds. The bovine version has five glycosylation sites. So it's not a trivial protein to manufacture, um, but like I said, it's multifunctional. So it supports uh, the immune system. It acts as a bridge between innate and adaptive immunity. It helps dampen um, inflammatory responses. It has two binding sites for iron, so it helps in iron delivery. It also can help sequester iron in the gut and prevent the outgrowth of potentially detrimental bacteria, as well as it additionally supports gut health by promoting the growth of the epithelial cell lining within the gut. And the statements that I'm making about functionality now are backed by thousands of research articles, including clinical studies from infants to children and into adults. Um, as you can see on the left, this in powder format is pink, so we affectionately call it pink gold. Um, and LF Plus is our brand for the lactoferrin that we'll be bringing to market later this year. Um, to compare it a little bit to conventional methods, it takes um, almost uh, 100,000 liters of milk to yield just one kilogram of lactoferrin. So although lactoferrin is in pretty decently high concentrations in milk um, in the first few days, it then drops off into the 50 to 100 milligrams per liter. Um, so it's a very scarce protein. Because of this scarcity and because of the complexity in the milk fractionation value chain, the price of lactoferrin is highly fluctuating um, as well as its supply. So one of our objectives is to stabilize the price and supply using fermentation. Um, we are currently in our pilot and heading toward our commercial scale manufacturing toward the end of this year, um, where we can very efficiently um, yield our one kilogram of, of lactoferrin. And making that comparator, we see that already our process um, is much more efficient on things like water usage. So lastly, um, we can envision lactoferrin being put into a variety of products. Right now, about 80% of the global supply is in infant nutrition, but only 5% of infant formulas have lactoferrin. So this really is still considered a premium product. 
But making it without the animal, animal free, we can now unlock other markets as well, including um, plant-based milks, for example, which are still um, nutritionally, you know, fall short of their, their dairy um, equivalents. Uh, we can also see it as supplements into yogurts, um, sports beverages. Um, so there's a wide variety of um, markets that already use lactoferrin, um, but that we'd also like to further unlock. Um, and just to give you an idea of what the price is, lactoferrin trades on the market around $1,000 per kilogram. So for a single serving, um, again, this is a very functional protein, so we only need about 100 milligrams. Um, that's 10 cents per serving. Um, so the cost economics, especially in early days as we're scaling up and optimizing, further optimizing our commercial process, is um, actually quite favorable. So with that, I'm going to end and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you so much. I'm not sure. Is that better? Okay. Just get closer then. Okay. Does this work? Yeah. Well, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Inya. I'm co-founder and CSO of New Culture. Um, and first of all, thank you to uh, the GFI for inviting us here. We're really big fans of GFI at, at New Culture, and we're super thankful for all the work you do to further further our field and support us founders as well. Um, and um, I want to share a tasty note with you, which is that every product and video that you will see today is actual new culture cheese. This is true of all of our materials, our website. We're very proud of our product. We put it first and center, and we really believe it's important for our integrity. Um, so at New Culture, we like to say we make cow cheese without a cow, very simply. So we make real tasty dairy cheese that doesn't come with the baggage of coming from an animal. And why do we make cheese? Um, if you look at the dairy market, cheese is, makes the, basically half of the entire dairy market in the U.S. It's a staggering $34 billion market. So if we want to truly disrupt um, the animal agriculture and have impact on planet, we cannot be making anything else. We have to be disrupting the cheese. It's very obvious um, that this is what we as a company have to do to achieve our mission and vision. And what you can see is that despite a massive demand for plant-based ingredients, sadly, plant-based cheese makes less than 1% of the entire market in the U.S. of these 34 billion, which is purely due, you might not be surprised, to very poor taste and texture, the experience that consumer gets, that consumer doesn't want to sacrifice on. And New Culture Cheese, New Culture Mozzarella, our first product, delivers on this experience fully. This is a healthy and nutritious product with full, complete protein source. It's a functional product that performs just like any other cheese on pizza. It's a delicious, tasty product that is sustainable, made from precision fermentation. And it's not a secret anymore that the way to make real, amazing cheese is to use casein. But casein in nature comes only in mammalian milk. This is just a snapshot of our powder after drying, you could, you know, confuse it for a powder you can buy in a shop and put your in your shake because it is truly bioidentical. Casein gives everything that we love about cheese, everything that we adore about that experience of cheese. So for mozzarella, the melt, the stretch, the texture, it all comes through power of casein. In nature, again, sourced only from mammalian milk, and we produce casein via precision fermentation. What that means is that we engineer microbes to produce our casein protein, grow it in fermentation tanks, isolate, purify that protein, and then use it with plant-based ingredients to make cheese using standard cheese-making processes. Again, starting with mozzarella, the queen of cheeses. Um, why we really believe that precision fermentation is the way to disrupt this market um, is because it's far superior compared to any other method available today in terms of speed of iteration, quality of product you get, precedent of regulatory pot, and viability at scale. While there is definitely very exciting development happening in molecular farming and cultivated field, um, we believe they, are, they have much bigger hurdles and longer path to market. 
and we need to come to market now immediately to act on climate. So New Culture will be the first to market next year with an animal-free uh, casein dairy cheese. And really enough about technology because the proof is in the product. So let me walk you through some of our cheeses, um, some of our photos. This is our block format that we will be selling into pizzerias. And what's really important to operators is that it can be shredded just like any cheese. It shreds beautifully, doesn't need any special handling. Our cheese can cook in any type of oven up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which is impossible of plant-based cheese. We can make any type of pizza. We're experts in Neapolitan, New York, Detroit, deep dish, name it. We, we are obsessed with pizza. And we can make chunks that basically perform just like your fresh mozzarella you can see here. And of course, it stretches, if you wonder. And really, we're doing this, as I say, to, to disrupt the pizzeria and the food service market, because you might not believe Americans love pizza. 70% um, of mozzarella in this country is eaten on pizza in the food service. Very consolidated market. We're very excited and proud to be entering the market with our dream chef, really, Nancy Silverton, um, who is really known for her integrity and hard work, who is known for uncompromised quality of the cheeses. Her pizzeria Mota is named after a cheese, and Nancy has never ever served an animal-free cheese in her pizzeria before. So next year, you'll be able to go to Los Angeles, go to Nancy's restaurant, and buy a pizza with our cheese on it. Um, here is just a little snippet from our collaboration with Nancy, and this is Herbie, her executive chef. Uh, we had phenomenal time working very closely with their team, uh, developing recipes for next year's launch. Um, margarita pizza and very unique new caponata pizza that Nancy's for the first time ever going to be serving on her menu and I can assure you it's as tasty as it looks like. So how were we able to do this under four years? Four years ago New Culture was an idea. Um, we started from nothing, really, my co-founder and myself. And today we have an amazing team of, again, very hardworking, dedicated, talented, focused scientists, engineers, and individuals, where we were able to go from bench through pilot through now commercial manufacturing scale for our casing. We spent a lot of time at pilot scale, and we believe pilot scale is your bread and butter. It's the core where we really optimize the process, where we really can use representative unit ops, where we can drive down the cost before scaling further and we can achieve specification we need for the both safety and quality of our ingredient. And um, you've seen a lot of really nice polished photos and videos, but I also want to show you here right from the lab and from the kitchen. So not, you know, from a nice fancy photo shoot. This is our cheese in action. This is my co-founder, Matt, just very excited to do his pull, our fork, fork pull test that we do on every batch. Um, and this is our cheese. This is our cheese from protein at scale. So um, we're incredibly proud of what we were able to achieve, and um, we're very excited, as I say, for what comes forward. So our vision. I'll end up with our vision. Our vision at New Culture is to lead the global change to an animal-free dairy future, and we really believe we do that by being a leader in casein, animal-free casein, and animal-free cheese. We've been identified in scale most functional caseins for cheese making. We've been able to engineer an optimal microbe to produce casein at unheard of high titers for this very challenging protein to make. We have a cost-effective, reproducible, and scalable fermentation and downstream process that gives on cost, on volume, and on spec protein. We've been ma making mozzarella for years now with, that achieves all the quality attributes that people care about, and we got in rave reviews of of hundreds of chefs and foodies so far. And we demonstrated quality and ease of use of our mozzarella in any type of pizza, pizzeria, and a restaurant oven. So with that, I invite you to join us on our journey towards animal-free dairy future, which will be tasty. All right, let's have some fun today. So in eight minutes, I'm going to tell you guys the story of how Triton Algae Innovations was a company that was going to cure pig diarrhea and became a company that makes plant-based foods. Uh, 
So my name is Miller. I'm uh, the founder and vice president of research and development at Trident Algae Innovations, and I've studied uh, algae for the better parts of the last 20 years. And so most people, when they think about precision fermentation, they don't really think about algae. And then when they think about algae, they think about like chlorella and spirulina. But we actually use an uh, algae called Chlamydomonas reinhardi, and it's actually the most studied algae in the world. The problem is it's always been in the academic realm because there was never really an industrial way to produce this algae. So in 2013, my mentor, Steve Mayfield, he came to me and he was like, Miller, I got this great idea. We're going to express milk proteins in algae, and then we're going to feed them to pigs so that we could reduce the use of antibiotics and prevent the pigs from getting diarrhea. And of course, he's my mentor, so I was like, brilliant, right? And so we did this, and we, you know, we ended up expressing all those proteins that you see there that can be found in milk. Um, and then we realized, Shh, you know, no one's ever really been able to grow this algae before. So we put together uh, a, a lab with a pilot facility, and so we've got two Amber 250, so 24 small 250 mil fermenters. We've also got 18 multi-4, 500 mil glass fermenters. We've got four 150 liter fermenters, 415 support for scale up, and then downstream processing equipment. All that's great, but could we actually industrially produce this algae? That was the question. And so if you actually look at pub the publications that are out there, the highest titers that anyone was ab ab able to achieve producing chlamydomonas was 1.5 grams per liter. Not protein, algae, <laughs> right? And so by 2019, this had jumped up to about 50 grams per liter in 10 days. At Triton, what we've done is we've truly industrialized this algae, and now we can produce it at 158 grams per liter in four days. So we could do this. We could express proteins. We could grow algae. Great. Let's go save the pigs now, right? And so we did a bunch of field trials. We did mice trials. We did pig trials. And here's the crazy thing. When we fed our algae, the wild type or the one expressing the protein, as it turned out, the wild type was just as effective, if not better. <laughs> and so we said, okay, well, you know, what's, what's our business model going to be here, Steve? Um, and so, you know, we had this kind of epiphany, which is it really doesn't make sense that we're trying to produce a sustainable ingredient to grow an unsustainable ingredient to feed to people. And so we said, shoot, let's just, let's do human food. And so we did all the toxicology work. We sent it into the FDA, and now we have a no questions letter for chlamydomonas as a protein replacement here in the States. Uh, subsequently, we've also got regulatory approval in Singapore and also now in China. And so we're one of the few ingredients that can be sold really in, in multiple jurisdictions today. Um, and then we said, well, does our technology truly scale? So our investor, he, he's just an algae believer. And so what he did was he sunk down a ton of money, and we built out a facility that has 880,000 liter fermenters, so about 1.5 million liters of total fermentation capacity. Um, and now we've, this year alone, we've produced 400 metric tons of algae sold. And in two years' time, we're projected to sell about 4,000 metric tons of algae. And so we're pretty excited about that. We've partnered with chefs. This is Brian Malarkey. He's, you know, a top chef. We've made some cool green foods. But at the end of the day, it was just still a green biomass. And it wasn't really exciting to a lot of people. So they, you know, a lot of people kept coming to us and saying, what else can you do? Show me something cool. So I said, look, precision fermentation is big. But the way I think about precision fermentation is a little bit different. The way I think about it is true precision means control of the genetics and control of the environment. The reason why agriculture today is not precision is because we can't control the environment. But we can control the genetics, and we have a history in our world of controlling the genetics. And so we control the genetics of the, the foods that we eat today by one of two methods, either by breeding or by using GMO techniques. And we've kind of gone away from the breeding, and the reason for this is breeding takes a long time. If you look at this slide here, this is basically corn as it used to be and corn as it is today. So it took thousands of years to get to corn as it is today. Because when we breed agricultural crops, we get two growing seasons a year. So it takes a long time for a new, um, new cell line or seed line to, to be released. And so we said, well, oh, <laughs> this is the cool thing about algae is that we can breed our strains literally every day. And so we get millions of iterations through the breeding of our algae. And so we said, okay, well, how can we apply this technology to something cool that's happening in the space? And it just so happened at this time, I had a really good friend who started working at the Good Food Institute when they were a really small organization, Liz Specht. Uh, she's an algae person, believe it or not. We did our PhDs together. And, uh, you know, she was telling me all about this cool company, Impossible Foods. And they engineer Pikia. They make, like, hemoglobin. It's so cool. And I was like, the problem I have with this technology is this. I love GM food, I love Impossible Foods, but half the world won't take it. And that's a, that's a uh, policy battle that you're going to have to fight. So what if we could do something that was non-GM? 
And so we said, look, if you look at all green organisms, the heme pathway naturally exists in all of them. The only difference is, is that the precursor, protoporphin 9, is typically shuttled into the production of chlorophyll. So chlorophyll and heme actually differ just by the metal uh, ion that's in, in, in the molecule. And so we said, look, what if we evolved our algae, we bred it and we evolved it and we selected for strains that no longer produce chlorophyll. And sure enough, we did this and you can see here, those are little algae cells and you find strains that are basically what we like to say, the first algae in the world to bleed. And so the algae itself is enriched for, for, the, for the heme pathway, but then we ran into another problem, which is unlike other precision fermentation companies, we're not isolating those compounds out. We're actually selling the whole biomass still and so really, this is precision on a whole other level because not only do we want to enrich the entire heme pathway, we've got to make all of the components of the cell work together. So at first when we made our algae, it tasted like metallic fish. And that's great for a tuna product, but as it turns out, when you want to make other products, that doesn't work. And so we've done a lot of evolution, a lot of selection, and we pay attention to the transcriptome of everything that we're making. And basically, we do this, and what we end up with is we've got strains that bleed that look, that taste like fish, and we've got strains that taste like pork. And it turned out pork was where we really excelled. And so, you know, we started making a bunch of products. We made burgers, we made hot dogs, we made tuna. We actually licensed the tuna out to a company at one point. It was that delicious. Um, but we said, you know, this is the kind of problem with the space is everyone's kind of making like a meat product, but it's always kind of good, but not quite good enough. And so then one Christmas, our CEO takes our alt pork home and he's just like, I got some family coming over, I'm just gonna make some stuff with it. And he makes dumplings. He puts green algae in the wrapper and he uses our alt pork in the, the inside. And he brought it into lab and we looked at him and we were like, this is freaking delicious. And he was like, oh, it's just something I was tinkering with. And we said, this is what the, the plant-based space has been missing the mark on. And we said, it can't just be about sustainability because food is very personable to a lot of, to, to everyone, right? It's our history. And so when he did this and when we ate this, we tasted his family's history. And for us, that's what it's all about right now. It's about creating sustainable ingredients that adhere to tra traditional standards of taste, texture, all of that. And so the mantra that we have is our stuff has to be where sustainability meets tradition. And you know, we've launched this product. We launched it at Expo West this year. Um, you can actually find it at the Marriott Marquis here in San Francisco. It's on their executive lounge and on the catering menu. If anyone's getting married soon, please have our dumplings. Um, and we will be in distribution uh, this in Q4, and so we'll be launching kind of nationwide. So uh, excited for you guys to try our dumplings one day. Hello. As the last speaker, I'm going to bring you guys all the way to Singapore. And my name is Yvonne Chow. I'm coming from the academia. And uh, I'd like to congratulate our speakers here for their wonderful achievement. We are non-commercial, uh, so I'm going to kind of talk a bit about the technical um, stuff. And definitely, first, would like to show my appreciation for your invitation to present at this con uh, conference. All right. So I come from CIFB, which is under ASTAR. Okay, Singapore is known for the acronyms. CIFB meaning the Singapore in Institute for uh, Food and Biotech Innovation. So our mission is to develop sustainable foods for the future, healthy, tasty foods for the Asian consumer and beyond. And to do that, we are employing technologies across uh, what you see here, end to end, um, disciplines and um, discovery, strain engineering, biotransformation, these three groups are all involved in what we are here today for, precision fermentation. And uh, under precision fermentation, what we're talking about are things like designing cellular factories, uh, building sustainable bioprocesses, and performing downstream processing. And we work next to our colleagues in the food side, food process engineering, nutrition, and analytics, so that that can be, the, the product from precision fermentation can be put through to food applications and um, taking care of the consumer preferences especially, um, and not forgetting safety. All right, so that's the 
intro, let's talk a bit about what precision fermentation involves. First step, the strain. So in strain engineering, what we want is a strain that is going to do fantastic things like use alternative feedstock instead of glucose and go through an efficient pathway to generate large, high amounts of specific molecules, nothing else, just what we want, and at high, tighter levels, and customizable um, products. But last of all, which is very often overlooked, we should find strains that are also bioprocess friendly so that we can ultimately work towards uh, a successful product, be it flavors or producing some enzyme proteins or lipids. So that's part one, strain engineering. As a young PhD candidate, I went to my professor and said, like the others, I want to do gene and engin engineering. But being from a chemical engineering background, he said, no, you should stay in bioprocess engineering because that's going to be important in the future. So now we are here in the future, and yes, you can't go from bench to formulation without going through bioprocess development. So this is uh, what I've been involved in for the last two decades, and it's really a problem that I guess not uh, many of us have solved to the fullest yet. So it's really uh, maybe not, not the focus, but very important. And I just wanted to display the, the whole problem out here, right? It's not just the fermentation, but you're going to have to deal with separation and the whole sustainability concept comes in here. Are we going to recycle your material? What happens to the unused material? What happens to the waste? And then now the important um, trend is waste valorization, right? So what feedstock are we going to use? And do the economics work out? And let's talk about scale up at the bench scale and then going up to the pilot scale and beyond. How do we actually accelerate this whole process in order to get to the market as soon as possible? There are different methods, but not really um, all very well used at this point in time. So we can do a simulation, we can do downscale uh, and all sorts of, um, you know, LCA and, and economic analysis, they are all there. We just need to be aware that these are the things we are going to have to tackle before we get to market, all right? So that's the strain and the um, engineering part. The last concept in this uh, whole recipe towards market uh, formulation, I would say, is uh, infrastructure. So we realized that the researchers in the lab and the startups wanting to commercialize all have something they need in between, which is the infrastructure to launch the product. So we have recently, in partnership with uh, Norasa, CIFB and Norasa have built this uh, food tech innovation center to provide that supportive infrastructure in Singapore to help launch various uh, companies in the alternate protein space or precision fermentation. So this involves process development, taking the ingredients and uh, putting it through our suite of bioprocess, bioreactors and downstream uh, capability, and then helping them to scale up. There are also uh, uh, space that they can rent and uh, they can leverage on uh, the expertise within CIFB and this uh, fermentation joint lab to kind of, through a, a community, try to build the... Um, the necessary uh, parts of, of this whole process and facilitate the final launching of, uh, let's say, uh, be it a, a alternate cheese or um, alternate coffee in uh, the fermentation side. And then in the same center, we also have pilot scale food processing equipment and expertise. And uh, that uh, dumpling is not only found in America, but also in Singapore. Uh, and we have also produced uh, uh, different versions of um, the dumpling or gyoza. But definitely precision fermentation is very broad and there are so many different kinds of products possible. Uh, so we are still 
on our end developing the different capability to handle all the different uh, yeah, materials. So, yep, welcome to Singapore anytime. Thank you. And do visit our booth over there, booth 512. All right. How oh, cool was that, right? So exciting. So thank you very much, Yvonne, for giving us the lay of the land of what it takes to go to idea to actually product, and it's been exemplified by many of those companies. Uh, we're going to walk you through a few themes of questions, uh, but please, in the audience, either in person or online, feel free to log in some questions, and uh, Lucas and Adam will make sure that uh, we'll get to that at the end. So maybe to get us started, um, some commentators may have said that plant-based is not delivering and commercially. Um, so in your mind, what are the metrics, what needs to happen for new ingredients to actually make it and convince consumers to eat, to eat them? Um, so maybe, I don't know, Aleta, if you want to get started? Sure. So um, I mean, just to, to clarify, Turtle Tree is aiming to be B2B. Um, we are not doing a B2C product, um, but we certainly do have perspectives from um, our potential customers in this area. And, and one thing, you know, talking to um, folks like Tyson Foods um, and, and other um, food companies is flavor is king. So that, that is a repeated um, message that uh, we have heard. Um, but I think that all of the things that you just mentioned are also important. I mean, cost is obviously a huge driver as well in making your choices at the supermarket. And we see that especially in today's um, economic environment. Um, as well as from the formulation perspective, there may be considerations um, around um, stability and um, you know, sensitivity to things like pH and, and um, you know, when the food is actually being made. So all of those things are considerations that on a B2B perspective um, we're seeing and, you know, getting the information back in terms of what are, you know, the consumer um, perceptions that, that are important. But um, unfortunately, I think everything is important, um, but it's just how you, you know, prioritize it and understand those priorities. Thank you. Uh, maybe, Inia, since you're getting a little bit closer to the consumer in the restaurants, what were the metrics that the chefs were asking you to hit? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's absolutely um, all about the, the taste and the experience, really. This is what we repeatedly uh, come to find. Um, people will start thinking about, you know, cost, nutrition, other things, but only if if the taste and experience is satisfied. For chefs in particular, it's kind of interesting model because we um, sell to consumer, but through a restaurant, through a chef. So there's operator uh, requests that they have. For them, handling is the most important. They really don't want to disrupt their operations. They don't want to train their team to go to do, you know, weird new things. So what they really want is the product that they know how to use, that can handle, that is robust um, and, you know, speaking with number of chefs, that's what we found out. And was, that's why I think people were very impressed with our product because they were like, uh-huh, this, this is just cheese. And, and they didn't expect that. They, you know, they really did not um, expect that even if they were convinced to, to try it. So uh, I'm interested trying to learn from you because you said that you're making a whole biomass. So it's an entirely new product, right? So what additional constraints do you have to, to comply to for people to want to adopt it? Yeah, I think that's just it. Adoption is, can you get someone to take a bite? And that's always been the, the biggest challenge because algae's got this perception that it, it's pond scum, it tastes like ocean. Um, so our, our biggest thing is, one, make delicious food and get out there and feed people as fast, you know. And so we've been at all these expos, Expo West, and just literally feeding people. And most times when people eat our dumplings, they're kind of confused because, one, it's a green dumpling. Um, but two, you know, we have that, that same kind of, oh, my God, this has got to be pork um, moment. And so, you know, for us, it took us a long time to develop it because what we realized is as a new ingredient, you kind of have one opportunity for a consumer to try your product. And if they don't like it, they'll never try it again, which is why, you know, going back to your first question, what's the problem with plant-based? I think the problem is there's a lot of companies who took this fail fast approach. And in food, they failed. if you fail fast, you're cons have you guys ever bought something, tried it, it was awful, and then said, I'll give it another chance. 
Never. <laughs> like, no one would ever go to a restaurant again. No one would ever buy a product again. So for us, we spent multiple years developing this dumpling to get it right, to make sure that, you know, we did all of our consumer testing and tastings and to make sure that that first experience was a, was a good one. Great. So it seems like there's a consensus around needs to taste good first, but there might be other metrics like potentially purity and cost. So Yvonne, I mean, you are, you are helping many companies in their, in their process to, to get to market. So what are the main type of studies or questions they ask you to help them solve? Is it cost? Is it purity? Is it taste? I think taste is, is one of the main questions that always come up. Because if without taste, it, it can't sell, then we can just stop there. Uh, next question would always be cost. Basically, for example, they want to do it at low cost, but in the shortest time, and still have a good product. So we have to work with the company together to try and find where's the, the best compromise um, and try to make use of technology to solve some of these issues. Great. So here, taste is king, but it still needs to be cheap of costs competitive for people to want to switch. And, and we had a discussion yesterday about uh, the S-curve and adoption and really for this market to skyrocket, we really also need to come down on the cost. Um, so maybe quickly, uh, 30 seconds each, you cannot mention any of your ingredients, but what is the one ingredient that's being value manufactured that gets you excited currently? I don't know who wants to start. I, I'm personally really excited about mycelium. Um, I've loved trying mycelium products. I, I've been buying a lot of meaty, not, not, you know, not, not a commercial for them on purpose. This is very genuine. I, um, been, yeah, I, I'm very excited about mycelium because it, has every, it could have everything. Um, it can deliver the texture, the taste. It's nutritionally immediately superior and great, and I think it's, 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 it's scalable. So. I wouldn't disagree. Anybody else has something exciting? I, I don't disagree with that, but I'm going to add um, sweet proteins on that. I'm very excited about sweet proteins um, because that also has a nutritional um, benefit, right, to, to, for sugar reduction, but you still get that flavor and some protein content as well. I, I'm excited about cellular agriculture and the ingredients they're producing. And, you know, it's kind of interesting to me because a lot of the things that we, hear, we see in publication is how they're reducing cost. But what actually really excites me about what they're going to be able to do is kind of what we're doing at Triton, which is as you scale, you can tweak your process in ways that completely alters the flavor profile. And so I'm excited to see what they can do with these different cell lines and how they can alter how those cell lines actually taste at the end of the day. Anything special coming from Asia? I, I guess I'm excited uh, on some of the exotic uh, yeasts and fungus which are able to produce really crazy amounts of uh, lipids and, and oils which are needed in the market. Yeah. Great. So we established that there are some exciting uh, products in the making here, uh, but again, to find adoption, you need to hit some metrics. So maybe we can go around again, and I would be interested to know what your company or what you suggest companies do when they actually pick a target, because as you said, Tran, you started to make milk for pig and it was maybe not the best target. So what are the metrics, what are the thought process around what is what I'm going to make? So I don't know who wants to start and we can talk about maybe business model later, but how to pick a good target? Who wants to go first? I can, I can jump in because um, as, yeah, I think we're, we tend to be very focused at new culture uh, in everything we do. Uh, so really for, for us, um, the number one thing you look at is you don't try to purpose technology to some application that people might or might not care about. You look at the problem in the market you want to solve. What's the job to be done? What is, what, what is this doing for a consumer? What is the product market fit? What is the need? And that was for us clear and number one reason why we're making this cheese. It's the most wanted product in the world right, right now and for years, right? And this can really truly completely change the emissions, the water use, the land use has massive impact. So for us, that's number one. And then it's, okay, how can we do this? How can we do this scalably, repeatedly, um, on cost? Um, what are the, for example, in our case, case, what are the casein proteins that can deliver this experience that can make cheese in the way that we need to make it and that can give the properties I talked about, melt, stretch, texture. 
Um, that kind of feeds backwards, right? But you start with end in mind and works backwards around what are these properties we need to achieve, then what ingredients can achieve them, what are technologies we can trial to, to scale them. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd like to say that um, all of these products are important, um, but it's really understanding, yeah, what is the consumer need? Um, so doing voice of the customer is very important for us up front. And that's how we came upon Lactoferrin, is talking to the dairy industry and really understanding what are their pinch points, what are their needs. Um, we also decided that we wanted to go for a technology that was scalable, so we did look at the availability of scalable technology and technologies that are in commercial manufacturing now. And we also down-select um, bioprocessing uh, modalities based on um, proof at commercial scale, because there's a lot of cool up-and-coming technology, um, but it often fails when you go from that R&D and pilot into commercial. So VOC and scalability were two big ones um, for us, as well as then just fitting that into the, the whole cost model. And I think that um, especially New Culture and Turtle Tree have, you know, we're coming at it from different angles. These are both important angles, but you know, there's obviously a huge total addressable market for cheese, whereas there's a much, much smaller addressable market for something like lactoferrin, but the price points are also kind of flip-flopped. Right? But I think that we need all of these kinds of products. Yeah, I would say for us as a company, one of the things that we start now from, from the very beginning is thinking about cost. Um, and I think this is where a lot of R&D or research scientists fail, which is we think about the cost of our production and then we look at the, the price on the shelf. We don't realize the price on the shelf has got the retail markup, it's got the distribution markup, it's got the you know, freight markup. And so all of that has to be considered when you're producing your product because at the end of the day, you've got to meet the consumer at their wallet. And most consumers are kind of hurting right now and so they don't want to spend a lot of money. And so, of course, long term, our costs always come down. But if the products that we're producing are only being sold at Michelin star restaurants, we're not really being sincere to the mission. We've got to make things that are accessible from a cost point for you know, the everyday consumer. For, for people like us, we look at um, selecting targets for tomorrow. So there are a lot of um, startup companies and larger companies who, who are experts at knowing what they're going to launch today. And then we will look at what's next, what will be needed for the next wave or the, what's the next um, so-called less easy to reach target and then we'll start working on it. Very good. Um, so uh, it's very interesting because we have an arc of companies doing different products here, uh, different, uh, with different microorganisms, but also different business models. So um, some are, of you are still on the business to business side, on the ingredient side, some are in between, some are fully on. So can, can you walk us through, was it clear from the get-go which way you're going to go or is it evolving? And what are your thoughts on that? Maybe you can start uh, with uh, Inga. Inga was... Sure. Um, Again, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of interesting, yeah, because it's, I think, for different proteins, different things make sense. That doesn't make sense, same approach, right? Um, so in our case, because you can make any dairy product out there with casein, that's the key structural protein of dairy, um, but because um, cheese has, as I said, biggest environmental impact and is the most, in a way, challenging and impactful, um, we, we thought it made sense for us to do the full uh, value chain ourselves because the, I would say the most challenging part is making this casein, right? Making this casein at scale and at cost. And once we have it, who is better in the world right now than us to know how to use it, to know how to make product with it? So it just adds extra value. Um, second thing that, some, I, something that um, Aleta shared is absolutely true. We are making a commodity ingredient. We're talking about like, ingredient that's sold today at very, very low price point. So if we were to try to sell our ingredient as ingredient, it would have no value. We would not be able to compete on it. But when we turn it into cheese, actually cheese is priced much better and it has added value in it. So from business point of view, it also makes sense for our ingredient because it's going to take us several years before we can come close to competing on a protein direct price point for a very large scale, low cost commodity ingredient. Makes a lot of sense. And, and lastly, sorry, for us, of course, important is that brand equity that we have by, by doing so. We don't then spend money in marketing, frankly, but just by getting product out there through really reputable restaurants. So, so Tran, uh, in your case, you're doing both, correct? Yeah. 
I, we're probably one of the crazy companies that, and there's a lot of us crazy companies here, but that, that are trying to do both. And for the primary reason that because our algae never existed in the food chain, so it's not like lactoferrin where it is in the food chain, we've got to introduce it to the consumer because relying on another company, we actually found was a mistake because we licensed some of our technology and then they never commercialized it, so we never received a royalty revenue. Um, in some cases, they did commercialize it and we did, but what we found is that you know, getting the right product to the consumer was more important in the long run to ensure that the ingredient sales happen. Um, and so much like, um, like uh, you here, uh, we produced a alt pork that actually people liked, and so then it was a value-added product versus just the algae itself. And so then, you know, and we had a price point that could do, be parity with uh, the pork that was being sold out there, and so people just buy the pork now from us as well. So we do, do, we do both. And you at Turtle Tree, you have a luxury to have a higher price point, so... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so we decided to put our resources towards, you know, meeting price parity, meeting the specifications as appropriate for the different applications, um, and not not doing a B2C play at this moment. Um, we have done some fun prototypes, though, for tasting events, and that's, that's always fun to play around with it. You know, we ha certainly have food scientists on our teams that understand how to work with the lactofair and are, are cooking up different kinds of foods and beverages. So it's not that it's not part of our journey, it's just not our focus now. Yeah, tried a few of your samples because they're working out of our kitchen at <laughs> Mista. Exactly, and it's been great having residency with Mista. All right, uh, so let's move on to some, uh, to some other part of a discussion which is around uh, bioprocessing and, and microbes and, uh, and Yvonne did a really good job at talking about uh, strain engineering and so on. So uh, what are the new approaches in terms of biomass, chassis, uh, fermentation that you think might help you get to cost parity? and better taste, because this is important, apparently. Maybe, Yvonne, you want to start? There are a lot of uh, areas which uh, strain improvement um, can help with, but uh, doesn't mean that it's simple. So things like being able to use a wider vi variety of feedstock, even uh, some people are developing strains that uh, can shorten the downstream process steps. So there are a lot of amazing things that can be done with the strain, but it's just how much time and you know, how challenging it is. And of course, the host that is being chosen, for example, if you're wanting to produce uh, lipids, then we should look into certain uh, classes of uh, microbes. Yeah. So that's, that's for the strain. And uh, definitely across the board in the, the process, integration is another important aspect. And, uh, it, it's uh, underestimated how much cost you can save just by integration and streamlining. John? Yeah, you know, at full scale, so we've, we've had the, the luck, really, to have an investor who sunk down enough to build 880,000 liter fermenters. And when, when you do your tech economics, you know, you're always scaling from the small scale all the way up to 180,000 liters. But if you design a process and, and involve your strains enough, you can actually go from 180 to 180. And that cuts down your actual full run time. And when you run your you know, super pro models, that actually brings the cost way down. And so we did this. We, we ran eight fermenters, and we staggered them, using them as seeds for the other ones. And we did that over the course of an entire month, running 24 hours a day for the entire month to drive our cost down. And we found if you can do that, if you can find strains where you don't have to replenish the media, you can deplete the media, and then not worry about um, loss of productivity along the way, that's how you drive costs down. So, you know, the cellular ag guys, they're going to have to figure that out too because if I have to harvest a lot, energy cost is a big problem. And so all these things that you can do to minimize processing and handling, it's going to drive costs down. Alita? Yeah, yeah, to totally agree with that. I mean, you don't want any of your unit operations sitting idle. So however you can design your plant to maximize the use of, of those steps um, for sure. But... Yeah, for us, tighter, tighter is king, as well as having a low, um, like, host cell protein background. Um, so we certainly hone in on those two aspects, but then working, I mean, casein as well, a complicated molecule, it still has to be functional. So you have to do all that battery of um, tests as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot to consider, but we do see that strain development and, and optimization is a continued process, just like continuing to optimize your manufacturing process. Um, we have our first generation strain, but you know, we, have the pro we started the program for the second generation strain some time ago, and, and we're working on that, and we'll continue to do that to, uh, to improve titers and drive down costs. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, really R&D never stops in a way. That's people are always like, but if it's so good, why do you keep trying to improve? And it's like, <laughs> because you, you come to talk about cents of a margin eventually. Uh, and so, yeah, first it's like 200,000 X reduction. So for us, again, making a commodity protein, um, for better or worse, we have to do it all. We cannot compromise on anything. Um, so our strain has to be extremely well performant. Uh, in terms of productivity, yield, and titer, um, our fermentation and downstream process has to be um, very efficient. And I think what is really hard for casein is to achieve. Um, it's been hard for us for sure, and, and we've achieved it: uh, very, very high yield in purification while maintaining high purity and quality. Those two usually don't go together, uh, so you have to sacrifice. We can't sacrifice on anything because our cheese. You saw our cheese, it cannot be green or blue or it cannot smell, like it has to be perfect and clean, the protein, um, and it has to be at high yield and at cost. So a lot of that later stage really comes from more um, optimization in manufacturing or at, at pilot scale is really where it's best done. And thinking through continuous improvements, how do you reduce uh, cycle runtime? How do you reduce handling? While again, what is really challenged for food is maintaining sterility because you cannot just run something, you know, I'm a big fan of continuous fermentation and I hope we get there one day, but co contamination is going to be a problem. So you, you have to, at, when you're in hundred thousands of liters, sometimes you, you want to be harvesting earlier because you don't want to have all that spoiled. Um, so it's just so many things that you have to really think of, especially when you're at scale um, and core strain be keeps always being the paramount, the productivity and ability of the strain. Otherwise, you can't squeeze it out of just the bioprocess. Great. Um, maybe a, a question around this line. Uh, we focus mostly on the front end, which is fer fermentation, the strain, but that's only a part of the equation when you look at the overall capex and opex. So very briefly, and maybe we can touch back on it later, uh, when you look at the downstream technologies, uh, what would be good enabler for the industry? to work on that to potentially apply for many companies? Yeah, so um, the, right now lactoferrin is isolated from milk using chromatography. And um, these are very big chromatography installations that can um, yield very high purity. Um, but their feed stream is very cheap, right? So we have a more expensive feed stream. It's higher concentration, but fermentation costs money, right? That's, it's pretty expensive. So we have to gain um, cost efficiencies on the downstream. Um, I, would, I would love to see some more innovation around chromatography and not necessarily resin-based chromatography, but membrane-based or monolithic chromatography that can flow a lot faster, um, can handle big molecules, and um, could also potentially be used to capture impurities and let your target through. So there's, there's a lot there that's, I think, not happening just because there hasn't been the need yet, and this industry can really, can really drive that. But yeah, improvements in downstream. Um, and you mentioned sterility. I mean, sterility is, yeah, this is not biopharma, but it still is food. And we have um, safety and sterility targets. Um, and even things like anti-fouling membranes to do um, sterile filtration if your product is heat sensitive um, would enable um, some products that are, that are out there. So I think there's a lot of work that can still be done um, to really tailor those downstream processes to this, this kind of process in industry. So GFI people, you're taking notes of what grants you need to write? Okay, go for proposal. Yeah. What I, do you add to the list, Inya? What else? Yeah, I fully agree. So on the, we, we use a range of, uh, of, of things, uh, definitely in the, in the lab, and then at scale even, um, our process is a combination of different separations and filtrations. And um, it uses all existing technologies, and I think there is incredible, actually, spectrum of technologies in the downstream. They've been just incredible to see for me. Um, the challenge is that the current fermentation plants and manufacturers, they really just don't have almost any of the downstream. So I would say all downstream is needed because they're typically more geared towards um, simpler applications like biomass fermentation, just harvest and some drying. Um, so we've really seen that challenge that no one has it all, kind of. Uh, whoever you speak with, you have to rent, buy something, figure out how to, how to make, because again, each process is slightly unique in a particular way in just how you run that unit operation that they might have and you might need a different type of membrane or a different type of technology. So I think it's a big gap and it has, it has been talked about a lot more in the last two years, but when we were just starting, 
it was a big gap for sure. People were just talking about fermentation. And I would say, like, yes, you end fermentation, but then you want to recover that protein yeah. and in time, again, like, and move it on. So. Fermentation is just the start. Yeah, exactly. And, and I do thank you for bringing up that challenge with working with external organizations because sometimes you have the great process, but you can't find someone who has the equipment that you need right now, right? Um, so you have to either put in that capital yourselves or, or try to, or you're, you know, limited and you're trying to um, take your process and adapt it to just what's available in the suite that you have access to. Yeah, eliminating steps in your downstream process is so crucial. And this is just for biomass fermentation, which is, you know, the cellular agriculture guys will, are going to have to figure this out too, which is for us, if we washed our algae and had to remove media components using centrifugation, you're talking about adding a dollar a kilo to the production of your biomass, which is a lot. And so we basically had to design a process to, to completely deplete the media components. You're basically left with cells and water. And then you have to be dense enough so that you can go straight into a spray dryer or else the cost of drying and the energy cost is going to be too high. So really, you have to be over 100 grams per liter for it to even make sense. And so all those downstream process optimizations and, and eliminating um, unit operations is going to be crucial for the success of this industry. So Yvonne, maybe I'll, I'll add a twist so you can answer that question, but also you are a service provider, so um, can you tell us more about what your new role is in the industry to help several companies uh, not have to reinvent the wheel? And, uh, and if people want to comment about how much they resource to in-house versus uh, external uh, providers would be interesting. On, from the angle of uh, process development, so uh, we would look at the, what's the goal at the end? And if we talk about downstream processing, uh, we can also help to discuss that with, with uh, different companies and look at uh, the problem that downstream processing is expensive. And also, uh, it, it's more approach from a chemical engineering uh, angle right now, but we forget that we are dealing with a fermentation where the product is really complex and dirty, so-called. So we would then try to see if we can minimize the downstream through improving the bioprocess itself, even considering things like uh, in-situ product extraction as you carry out the process. So there are kind of a few interesting uh, technology and tricks that, that uh, can be applied. Some of them are more appealing to the customers, some are more academic exercises, but uh, we have basically a whole range of different uh, approaches which we will share and see what applies. I'm realizing that the time is running really quickly, so maybe I'll ask you a 30 seconds answer for the next question. What are your views as a company, and again, some of you already shared with that, uh, about uh, putting your own steel in the ground versus going to uh, a CMO to actually manufacturing your product? So you put steel on the ground, so you, why in 30 seconds? Uh, so going to a CMO was a nightmare, <laughs> first off. So we went to a contract manufacturer. One, their equipment was old. It was not suited for our fermentation. And so we spent literally a year and a half trying to make our process fit their equipment. Um, and so I would say if you're going to go to a CMO, understand which CMO you're going to go to so that you understand what equipment they have so that you can actually build your process from the get-go fit for their facility, or else you're going to have to put steel on the ground eventually. Anybody at the reverse? Uh, feeling about using CMOs and love it? Yeah, definitely. Actually, we, uh, it, you know, it's challenging, tiring. Your team has to be on the ground. You have to work really closely, but we've been very successful working with CMOs only. And uh, at the first get-go, actually scaling our process successfully, which has been really exciting to, to see. Um, I think it's an environment, especially today, uh, where I don't think investors want to really give money to put steel in the ground. And we have to have technology that can be deployed and cost effective at existing facilities where we don't have to yet put steel in the ground. That's our goal. Um, at least that's something we're, um, we're actively working towards. Second thing, you don't know what to build until your process is developed and tested at scale. How do you know what to build? You want to build custom. It's really most efficient if you run your process an ideal kind of setup for your process, which again, you don't have at a CMO. Um, but you, and you need to start building something three years ahead of time, right? Put the money down. So you really have to be confident in your process 
Um, so I think for us, it's really important that we prove our process at scale at a CMO and get the cost down and are competitive. And of course, one day we want to have our own facility. I see you nod a little. Uh, same yes, note. Very, very much agree. Similar journey. Um, but just want to add that um, it's maybe a little bit easier for precision fermentation companies because, again, this infrastructure is in place. For cell-based, that infrastructure does not exist. And so that's why you've seen those companies put in, like, pilot plants and talk about building their own facilities because they're just, there is no CMO for cultivated meat or cell-based milk, for example. So that, that will have to come. Um, but, yeah, with the infrastructure in place, it doesn't make sense for us to, um, to, to build that without demonstrating our product. There's, you know, market pull and that we can generate revenue first. All right. Uh, in the sort of time, let's move on to another type of topic, which is we all love that, regulatory. We all know that regulatory can really make or break a product, adding a lot of years on the timeline. So, again, maybe uh, very quickly, if you can uh, give us some uh, thoughts that went through your mind in terms of choice of chassis, I mean a grass and not grass strain, a choice of what type of lactoferrin, the human one or the, or the bovine one, I mean how do you balance the perfect product and the perfect strain versus the regulatory constraints? I don't know if you want to start? Sure, so um, we, we are using a strain that's already in the food system, so that helps. Um, and uh, we are choosing bovine lactoferrin, and part of that calculus there, part of it, not all of it, but part of it was regulatory, because bovine lactoferrin is already in the adult um, food system, and that's what we want to target initially. Um, and we, because of those things, we were doing a self-grass assessment, um, and that we're in the process of, of pulling that together to put to the expert panel, so that, that process, at least in the U.S., is underway. Singapore will be a fast follow-on. Um, again, that's for adult application. For infant nutrition, it's um, a different story. They're completely different, spe not completely different, but different specifications, especially around um, purity. And um, then there's further um, data as well as clinical studies that need to be performed. So that is a much longer, rightfully so, a much longer process. Um, regarding other geographies, uh, we're just starting that journey as well. Um, and it may be a little bit more challenging, a little bit longer, um, at least in the UK. I don't know about the European F EFSA, but the UK um, FSA put out a statement last year, a, a report on alternative proteins. And in that report, they did um, their kind of broad brush assessment is that many of these products they would consider novel, novel products, which is a longer pathway. Um, we'll walk that journey, but right now we just want to get into some geographies with our, our first product. Yeah, so um, because of, of wanting to um, come to market as, and disrupt, you know, take the market as soon as possible, because we don't believe we have time, really, otherwise, with the climate, um, we decided to take a very pragmatic approach as well, which is to use organism that is already grass and use a protein that has very strong history of safe consumption in humans uh, for maybe some very future proteins and strains that's not going to be the case, but right now that really enables us to follow the regulatory path the fastest, uh, the fastest possible. Same, we're undergoing the uh, self-grass path in the U.S., um, and I think in the U.S. there is a, a can, very clear precedence and, um, of regulatory path, and it's very well communicated, established. FDA also talks to, you know, talks to companies. Um, in other countries, it seems uh, different and, and more challenging. Um, we are fully focused on the U.S. market. Alone in the U.S., as I was sharing, it's a $34 billion market cheese, and we don't think we're going to, for another 50 years, produce enough to, you know, take just U.S. market, basically. So... We're going to be here, uh, be here and growing here for a while. So what about uh, taking a whole new strain of algae to, uh, to regulatory status? Yeah, you know, for me as a scientist, and this is my nerdy part, um, I look at algae and I look at all green biotechnology, and what I see is a, just a world of untapped potential in the same way that, you know, when someone developed the tools for yeast to express proteins, you guys are able to now, you know, stand on top of the, the shoulders of people who did that. And so for us, you know, of course we want to do something that impacts today, but we want to lay the foundation for tomorrow. And so, yeah, we do a lot of grass applications now. We've done four grass applications here in the States. Uh, we're in the process of additional no questions letters from the FDA. We do the self-grass process as well. What's nice is in China, their scientists were actually trained in the FDA here in the States, and so their, their grass process is nearly identical, for, you know, in case anyone was wondering. And then EFSA is 
slow. <laughs> and, um, but you know, the nice thing about EFSA is there's certain countries that use the EFSA process. So if you go to Brazil, you go to Argentina, they use EFSA type processes. If you go to Chile, they use USDA or sorry FDA um, grass type processes. And so there's a lot of overlap between re regulations across the world. So I think that's going to help accelerate things. Um, but it, ultimately, yeah, for me as a scientist, just unlocking the potential of green biotechnology has always been kind of near and dear to my heart. So what I hear is that the U.S. system is potentially a little bit more favorable than other geographies like Europe, but uh, I think the leader in the many spaces is uh, Singapore. So Yvonne, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, how Singapore does it to be on the forefront of approval for very new technologies like silver meat? Well, I, I'm not from uh, SFA, I, so I wouldn't be able to speak on their behalf, but uh, for um, this kind of development, it's always encouraged to start the dialogue with SFA as soon as possible. So they kind of adopt an uh, approach of a uh, collaborative approach, which is nice. Um, for scientists like us, we also tend to choose the grass uh, organisms to study, especially we, if we are planning to uh, work with the com commercial partners. But on the other hand, we also want to explore the um, great amount of opportunities that lies within certain microbes that are you know, not grass status yet. Uh, so when, when we screen, we do kind of um, throw the net a bit wider and are hopeful that one day in the future, some of these will become grass. Yeah. Great. Uh, I really want to save five minutes for the question from the audience. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so I'll, let's, I'll keep five minutes. So maybe the last question from me is we here today because uh, GFI, MISTA, many organizations really want to promote the adoption of new technologies and work together. So we believe there's a lot of room for pre competitive work, for companies to come together. We already touched on a, a few topics, technical topics that where you see that they might be interesting for the companies to and the industry to come together to develop new chromatography or new uh, DSP uh, pieces. Um, but beyond the technology angle, uh, what do you think the industry needs as a whole to really be successful and, and again have an impact faster? You know, I think as a whole, we got to weed out the people here. We're here for the fast cash. And uh, what we need is the, the people who are going to stick around and fight the good fight. And, you know, the whole reason actually, I, I didn't tell the story, but the reason why Trident became a plant based meat company was because I had one friend who happened to join the Good Food Institute, you know, and she, she was a devout vegan. And, uh, you know, because of her, I looked into this industry. And so I think that advocacy should never stop. And that's absolutely essential. And, you know, something that, you know, uh, Liz, the VP of <laughs> GFI, um, her and her husband, actually, when I went, was going through my own vegetarian journey, one thing that they said to me that's always kind of stuck with me that I think the entire industry really needs to hear is, they said, if you stumble, it's okay, just keep going. And so I would say the same thing to our industry, which is obviously it's a tough time right now, but you're going to see the people who've got that kind of grittiness to stick it out, to figure out how to make the dollars stretch a little bit further and to survive this, this tough time, and we'll come out better and stronger for it. Yeah, so in, in precision fermentation, we really um, do come together in many ways and together with Turtle Tree together with other companies, one of the ways you've probably seen publicly that happens is through our Precision Fermentation Alliance, um, which really has been formed to work together towards uh, common challenges. What we see in our industry be a big common challenge is also naming, labeling, uh, education of consumers. Um, we've been fortunate some of the more mature big companies in our field have been willing to share some of their data and findings with us. Uh, New Culture is actually just completing our own research on this. Um, and so it, we, we want to share across the field um, and understand. We, we find, um, to give you a story from chefs, because we interact with chefs the most, uh, I mean, just how long it took us to figure out how to explain what our product is, right? They try it, they did, but they still, you still, they still don't understand fully like what it is. So we keep iterating A versus B and trying and, <laughs> and trying to figure out like in the field, you know, what works, what works for different people. So I think all these challenges together with frankly, um, working with the government and working with the, with the larger policymakers and infrastructure, which has been really to me sadly lacking um, in, the, in this field, or it's been, it's been not done enough. I would say, compared to some other clean technologies out there. So that's where we really come together. 
Yeah, and I think that um, organizations like Precision Fermentation Alliance is, is a great engine to bring um, companies together and start these discussions around regulatory. This also happens privately between companies, you know, non-competing companies that are using similar technologies. We have friends in the industry like that that we share a little bit more information with, sort of tips and tricks, whether it's downstream or other things. Um, but regarding policy, you know, Good Food Institute, of course, is doing a lot of advocacy and policy work, but there are also other organizations that we're engaging with, um, for example, Food Solutions Action um, that is active on both coasts. So in, um, I, I sit in the Boston area, so the, which the Boston ecosystem is quite a bit smaller, but it is growing, so you know, please come to the East Coast. Um, and we have been sitting with local policymakers, um, you know, folks from the alternative protein industry together um, to have these conversations, to educate them about um, how you know, this industry could help grow um, commerce in, in Massachusetts, for example. And these are, you know, really local policymakers um, that aren't necessarily, um, you know, educated yet about alternative proteins and the processes. But there's so many parallels between the technologies and the talent that's already existing in the Boston area and other areas and what's needed for this industry. Um, it can be a pretty smooth transition as well as opportunity to push some of that technology outside of the urban areas and into the suburbs and rural areas um, to, to continue to grow, you know, precision fermentation and all proteins and get that infrastructure in place. Any thoughts, Yvonne? I think that the consumer movement is going to be key in driving the industry forward because it's really going into the consumer's mouth. They need to be excited about the new products being, that are coming out and want to eat it because of particular benefits that are going to stay in the long run, not something that's just a hype of the moment. Great. Adam, any questions from the audience? We have a, f a few questions through Swap Card that I'd love to go through that we can, we can go through in a few questions. So Yvonne, this is, this is a question that relates back to what you were talking about with uh, the next generation of, of precision fermentation proteins. Do you think that the next generation of proteins is going to be something that, that we're still sticking with that it's good because it reminds us of the animal-derived protein, or is there another set of flavor experiences that we're going to be able to get out of precision fermentation that will help to, to bring this uh, industry forward? So your, your last part of the question was... So is it going to be animal, like animal-derived protein replacements or total, oh. like totally new flavor profiles that will come from these? I'd like to cast that out wide. Why, why are we limiting ourselves to animal protein replacements? I come from a country where the vegetarian cuisine is very strong, and that's plant-based. So I'm just always curious, what, what could be the next kind of uh, cuisine that we come up with? Because there are a whole uh, community out there that, that are already, for the longest time, eating animal, uh, so-called mock meat, you know, animal replacements. Um, so let's, let's see. Uh, to me, it's, it's not about categorizing. It's just what would people eat next. Great, thanks. This is a question I think that some of the innovators out there in the audience uh, wanted to ask. If each of you could name what you think is the biggest bottleneck and something that people could be working on that would really bring forward the precision fermentation industry. I, th I think cost is one of them. Yes, it's a, still a, a big barrier, but we are slowly chipping away at this um, challenge, but it would need more technologists to work together. I actually go back to your first question, which is we need that home run, right? Which means, and companies generally don't take that kind of home run risk, and so what I would love to see is more funding going to universities so that these professors, these students that have big aspirations that are super creative can swing for the fences because when you create that next big thing, it goes into everything. And I use the example of, you know, omega-3s, right? 20 years ago, no one cared about it, and now it's in everything. And then there was xanthan gum, right? It's a plant product. It doesn't have to be an animal product, but if you can innovate that next big thing, it, it puts more eyeballs on our industry, and it's, it's something that we can shine a light to, too. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very challenging question because I don't think there is a one thing. Um, for us, for more mature companies, it's for sure the manufacturing capability and, and just 
existing, <laughs> having manufacturing to deploy into. I think for longer term and for earlier stage, um, I mean, strain, strain engineering is always paramount. The ability of combine, you know, flexibility of different chassis for different proteins, because for some molecules or proteins, it's, it's not predictable. A lot of people try to make it predictable and say it is, and we can do everything from data, and AI is going to solve it all, but it's not. You have to go into the lab and try thousands of things, and often we don't understand still why certain things work a certain way. Not, you know, not everything is um, uh, completely uh, kind of targeted rational design. And so I think that's just, just having a bigger library, bigger spectrum of things to work with for different proteins, for different molecules, but that takes years, decades to build. That's the challenge. Yeah, biology is noisy. I think that's where bi biology and engineering have to come together and sort of understand everyone's language to see that. I'd love to see a scalable, continuing, continual processing for fermentation. So something to drive really high titers, but that you can just run, run, run. You don't have to take down and restart, do the clean in place, steam in place, and just be able to generate really high yields. That'd be wonderful. Celine, do you have a, a bottleneck or an opportunity in precision fermentation that you're, you're thinking about? Oh, wow. I'll turn it to one I question towards I wasn't you. ready for that. I was, I I was done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we touched, we touched on a lot of things. Uh, I think as a whole, I kind of keep the end in mind. I think in the end, what we need is to, to bring all of those ingredients together into an integrated solution to foods and beverages. So really having companies, big and small, work together, explore, being in the kitchen to really make true products that people love. You mentioned advocacy, consumer uh, acceptance. I think we all need to come together to make good stuff. And on the nose, we're done. I want to thank the panel for your, um, your enthusiasm, your great work, and uh, all your insights. Uh, and I hope it was informative for you guys.